run some instructions for our meetings. We've returned to in-person meetings, but keeping hybrid options to allow public participation and remote presenters, which is a big benefit, especially for our committee. But first, I'd like to check with our clerk to confirm that we have quorum. Clerk. Thank you, Chair. We do have a quorum. If it's uh, okay with you, we'd like to do a roll call for the benefit of those who are online. Oh, I'm sorry. If we could do the interpreter first, actually. Uh, thank you, Chair. We'll begin with the announcement in Spanish, and then we will uh, be back with the announcement in English. Para hacer uso del servicio de interpretación, favor de desplazarse a la parte inferior de la pantalla de Zoom, donde aparecen los controles. Haga clic en el icono de interpretación globo terráqueo y seleccione Spanish, Español, si está usando la aplicación móvil de Zoom, celular, tableta, etc. O presione los puntos suspensivos, luego interpretación y luego el idioma. Además, para acceder a los servicios de interpretación de manera presencial, pida auriculares en la recepción. Uh, in order to use the Zoom interpretation feature, please scroll to the bottom of the Zoom screen where the meeting controls are. Click on the interpretation icon, World, and select either English or Spanish. If you are joining using the Zoom mobile app, cell phone, tablet, etc., please press the ellipsis, three dots, then interpretation, and then choose your language. Additionally, to access English, Spanish, simultaneous interpretation in the room, in person, check out the headset from the receptionist. Gracias, and thank you, Chair. Now that we've heard the instructions for language interpretation, Please let me respectfully acknowledge that we live and work for uh, oh. oh, what the, okay. <laughs> I apologize, my uh, council member training wheels are coming off. This is my first meeting that I'm chairing. Okay, now that we've heard the instructions for language interpretation, please let me respectfully acknowledge that we live and work on traditional, ancestrally, and unceded land of tribal nations. Um, I apologize, apologize if I mispronounce any of these names, including the Kumaye, the Luceño, the Cupeño, and the Kawila peoples. We share strong historical and cultural roots that unite us with all of our neighbors as we continue in a hybrid format. Border committee members participate, participating remotely are subject to special rules. Francesca, can you help us? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, the There are two situations where a, a member can participate remotely. One is for just cause participation, which includes um, the need to uh, for child care or the caregiving of a child, parent, grandparent, sibling, spouse, or domestic partner, um, a contagious illness that prevents the member from attending in person, um, a need related to a physical or mental disability, or travel on official business of the legislative body or another state or local agency. Um, <clears throat> in the event that the uh, member meets those criteria, then they are allowed to participate remotely as long as they are able to leave their camera on for the entirety of the meeting. Uh, they may mute themselves when they're not speaking, but the camera must remain on at all times. Um, and uh, it would also require us, <clears throat> excuse me, to vote on a roll call basis rather than using the um, the uh, voting clickers in the room. Um, also, a member should be advised that if they participate remotely, they do not count towards a quorum for the purposes of holding the meeting. Um, the other um, situation where a member can participate remotely is for an emergency, um, if there is, um, in, in which case they would need to uh, provide a general description of the circumstances, um, and it would require a vote of the legislative body to allow that participation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Although we are more or less familiar, let's review the following guidelines for conducting the meeting virtually via Zoom. Members of the public, including Borders Committee members that would like to speak on an item, please use the raise hand icon on the Zoom toolbar when you are called on by the chair of the clerk. You will be unmuted by Sandag staff. If you're calling in by phone, you need to enter the star six to unmute yourself. After your comments, you will be muted by Sandag staff. 
If you're calling into meeting, please press star nine on your phone if you'd like to comment on an item. All comments, whether emailed or live, will be made a part of today's meeting record. <clears throat> As you have noticed, I'm honored to have the opportunity of chairing this Borders Committee, and I want to introduce my colleague, Supervisor Jesus Escobar from Encount uh, Imperial County, who will be our vice chair. Jesus, my pleasure. I guess that with that, we can move on to our agenda. Happy to be vice chair and happy to assist you on a day in day out basis as we continue uh, this rock and roll year 2023. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. So this is not our first meeting, but maybe our first opportunity to meet each other. Let's briefly introduce ourselves. Uh, my name is Matthew Leba Gonzalez. I'm the mayor pro tem from the beautiful coastal city of Imperial Beach. So I'd like to go down and have everyone introduce themselves um, and so that we can get to know one another better. Okay, Vice Chair. This is Eduardo Escobar, Supervisor District 1, Imperial County. Uh, I'm happy to be here. Victoria Stackwick, Chief of Staff, Sandag. Thank you. Betsy Blake, Senior Legal Counsel, Sandag. I'm uh, Paul Ganster. Uh, I'm chair of the Committee on Binational Regional Opportunities, or COBRO. Yes, good afternoon. I'm Gilberto Luna. I'm the Deputy Consul General of Mexico. I'm here on behalf of our Consul General, Ambassador Carlos Gonzalez, who sends uh, his regards and his apologies for not being here. Good afternoon, everyone, and congratulations, Chair and Vice Chair. Um, I'm Gustavo Dalarda, the District Director for Caltrans. Uh, for District 11, which encompasses San Diego County and Imperial County. Val Macedo, Jr. I'm here on behalf of the San Diego County Water Authority. I am Crystal Ruiz. I am the Mayor Pro Tem of San Jacinto. I am also the Chair of Western Riverside Council of Governments and the new IRON. I'm Laura Koval, Vice Mayor, City of Santee and Native East County resident. Uh, Dave Drucker, member of the Del Mar City Council. District 2, uh, Supervisor Jolie Anderson. Good afternoon, Vivian Moreno, council member for the city of San Diego. Hector Vanegas, Borders Program Manager, San Diego. Thank you, every, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, let's move on to item number two on the agenda. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I wanted to start by sharing that we are extending the Youth Opportunity Pass program. For now, we'll be extending it for a few months consistent with the board approved budget, but we have identified funding for an additional, for another year. This program has been more successful than we ever imagined. Youth ridership is higher than ever. We look forward to working with MTS and MCTD and the county to make this, pro this program bigger going forward. We want to be able to say to all youth, including high school and college students, that they can ride for free. In regards to the regional plan, it continues to be the driving force behind much of what we do. As directed by the board, we are taking the road usage charge out of the plan. Meanwhile, we are starting work on the 2025 regional plan. The plan will meet all state and federal requirements and policies set by the board. It will also be true to our commitment to social justice and social equity. We use data and modeling and technical tools to determine the regional plan, and we started talking to communities and working groups. One of our other priorities is the Central Mobility Hub. <laughs> the most important part of this project is connecting our international airport to rail. Every urbanized area that has a train, every urban airport has a train that takes you to the city. We are one of the only major urban areas that does not have this, so we are working on plans to move this project forward. Work is also continuing on Otay Mesa East. There's a lot to do. We are working with our federal partners, CBP and GSA, to make sure that we've identified funding for the project. But one thing is clear, that when it's delivered, it will benefit everybody in the region, state, and nation. Our partners at the state and federal level have also shown their support, and their only remaining task is to get CBP and GSA and to get the funding needed to take this project over the finish line. Several months ago, as you may have heard, we also received 300 million um, for the Del Mar tracks, Del Mar Bluffs. Last December, the CTC allocated 152 million of this funding towards this effort, and we're starting the work now. 
We want this corridor to go from an average of 60 miles an hour to 110. We want to be able to go from San Diego to Los Angeles in two hours rather than four, and we believe it's doable. We're at the beginning of the environmental and design phase, and we're doing everything that we can to keep funding like pro other projects on the corridor, like the San Diego Bridge replacement, moving forward. Finally, we are working to start planning on improvements for the blue line and purple line. Both of these projects will connect people with their jobs and opportunities to key connections for the entire region. Earlier this month, we received an exciting honor from the United Nations. They have identified SANDAG as a model of collaboration and we want to share our work with the world. They have asked us to attend their General Assembly in June um, in Kenya, and we take this responsibility very carefully and very seriously, and it's our way to give back. This is an opportunity for San Diego to be seen as a major region. San Diego has also received several other awards. Our open data portal was selected for the 2023 Data and Insights Tyler Excellence Award. The San Diego Lagoon Restoration Project is receiving an award from the Environmental Business Journal, and the Del Mar Bluffs Emergency Repairs was awarded an uh, award by the American Society of Civil Engineers, Region 9, for outstanding geotechnical work. Congratulations to all of our staff who make these impressive projects come to life. And last but not least, a quick uh, update on the downtown stopover. Um, we received our NEPA clearance uh, to clear the portion of the property that we've purchased from the San Diego Bar Association. SANDAG is working to complete the purchase of the remaining parcels so that we can assist MTS in ensuring long-term improvements to um, having the buses on the curbs and, uh, and whatnot for their employees. Um, Last but not least, I guess that was not the final one, but ITALK is uh, seeking qualified members uh, of the public to fill two of the seven vacancies. If you know of anyone who would be a good fit, please direct them to our new section of our website um, or contact SANDAC staff. This concludes my report and I would be happy to answer any questions that you may have at this point. Uh, thank you very much, Victoria. Do we have any public comment on this agenda item? Thank you, Chair. We do not have any public comments on this item. Do we have any uh, comments from any members of the board? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, that was agenda item three, and we we skipped over um, public comments for item number two. So to regress a bit, do we have any public comments for agenda item number two? Thank you, Chair. I don't see any hands from the public. Uh, any comments from members of the board? Okay, that concludes item two and three. We're, we're shaking and baking here. Um, Moving on to item number four, uh, Borders Committee. Hector, it's your turn. Thank you. Buenas tardes. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes. Uh, Hector Vanegas, I'm the Borders Program Manager of SANDAG, and also I am the liaison for this committee. But before I do my presentation, I want to acknowledge that there is a village uh, working behind the meeting, and I want to recognize uh, all of my colleagues here, starting with uh, our legal counsel, Betsy Blake. She's uh, uh, supervising us all the legal uh, behind the committee. Uh, we also have production uh, team with Danielle and Kendall over there. You, if not possible to have this meeting without them. Obviously essential is our clerk, which is Francesca Webb and that you already know and Tessa was around here somewhere. And I want to also introduce uh, from the planning area, uh, Zach Hernandez, Imanol. Uh, they also provide uh, input for the preparation of the agenda and as well as uh, Paola Samudio and Paul Lafarga for the program with the tribes. So a village uh, works behind uh, uh, these agendas. And uh, let me, since I, I think we have some new faces, I want to go back to uh, the beginning of SANDAG in 1966, when the agency was created within the county of San Diego. At that time, we didn't have any institutional uh, work relationship with Mexico. But when the agency uh, uh, became a joint power authority, uh, uh, agency independent, uh, immediately included Mexico as part of the governing board. So that's when we started working with our partners south of the border. Uh, that was around 1972. In the 1990s, when uh, NAFTA was signed, the North American Free Trade Agreement, SANDAG uh, created its first uh, uh, task force, which was COBRO, the Committee on Binational uh, 
regional opportunities that uh, provides input to this committee. So that was in 1996, 27 years ago. But it was until the turn of the century in 2001 when Sandak reorganized the, the uh, 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 committee uh, uh, organization and created this Borders Committee. That was in 2001, a memorable year uh, for the border that uh, changed the way we live here. Uh, but that's that was 22 years ago when this uh, committee started sessioning in February of 22, uh, a year, uh, uh, the same month as of today. So uh, the Borders Committee was created as a policy, one of the six policy committees now, uh, to broaden the vision not only to work by national perspective or by national issues with Mexico, but to have an interregional uh, uh, work with our neighboring counties, Orange, Riverside, and Imperial, but also to explore and enhance uh, the working relationship with the tribes, uh, 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 with a government-to-government -government relation. So that was... Uh, um, in 2001 and in 2003 the the committee was uh, reaffirmed in law sb 1703 in 2005 is when the uh, southern california tribal chairman's association was created and was invited to be a member of this committee and later was uh, 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 working in other policy committees and to the board uh, uh, and the and the tribal program created a technical working group that is also providing input to this committee uh, every now and then. Uh, the responsibilities that this committee have are included in policy uh, board 001 that is included in your agenda packet. But I can uh, uh, summarize this as overseeing the preparation of the planning uh, uh, programs for binational and interregional activities, and also to foster the relationship with the government of the tribal nations in San Diego. You also have delegated the responsibility to, to advise the board on finance, financing strategies for border projects, and also to review uh, the impact of projects in adjoining, adjoining counties. So that's a summary of your uh, responsibilities. The committee meets on the fourth Friday of every month, but uh, normally August is a dark month for Sandak, but we have meetings if it's needed. And also for Friday conflicts on the months of November and December with the holidays. So we, if it's needed, we change our meetings to the third Friday. And to conclude, I just want to mention a little bit what uh, Victoria already mentioned. Um, your activities are have been observed and are observed by uh, uh, beyond our borders. And earlier this month, the United Nations, the Habitat Program, uh, visited us and visited our partners of Baja California. And they let us know that they want to use the, the model of Sandak for metropolitan collaboration to be shown uh, in the rest of the world uh, during the General Assembly that will be held in in uh, Kenya in later June. So with that, I conclude my report. And if uh, you have any question, I would be happy to answer. Thank you very much. Um, let's first hear if there's any comments from the public, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Chair. We have no comments from the public on this item. Okay, let's hear if the Borders Committee members, do, do any of you have any comments? Council Member Moreno. Wonderful. Thank you for that presentation and taking us through the history of um, Borders Committee. Um, <clears throat> I think, um, and just for the folks that don't know, I have the honor of representing the San Isidro Port of Entry and also the Otay Mesa Port of Entry, um, the most cross border of the world and the second most important commercial crossing of um, the nation. And, <clears throat> you know, we, we come to these meetings every month and we don't really conceptualize and, and really take in how important it is and how uh, how much, and I, I, I guess the what has made me, what, what has prompted me to speak today is the, the fact that the United Nations is recognizing this body as a model for the whole international arena, right? To, to showcase how, how much we've been working together and how important these meetings are every single month um, for not only for the commerce of the United States, but obviously the binational commerce that is very important. Um, over $51 billion of commerce passed through Otay Mesa alone. Um, I could speak for, you know, for, for my district and how important these meetings are. And also, I, I want to thank um, Hector Venegas for all of his work, all his commitment. Um, he not only has to uh, uh, 
um, how can I put this? He not only has to uh, manage and deal with the, this side of the border's elected officials, but he also does it in the Mexican side and he does it with a lot of eloquence and um, always very sharply dressed. So um, just wonderful. And thank you for always, I, I could speak for myself. Thank you for always advising and um, and for just being a great advocate for the whole region. Um, and one, like I said, I'm just wowed about the United Nations recognizing us. That is a gargantuous deal. Um, did we apply? Uh, did they recognize us? What is what is what's going to happen in Kenya? I, I want to know more. If I can add, uh, uh, they've been observing our our mechanism since years. Uh, let's say since 2016. But uh, lately, they got uh, uh, an approach to the state of Baja California and us to go to a fruition process. And they uh, they learned more about us. They visited us uh, earlier this month and met with the executive uh, team and with the chair of uh, Sandag to learn. And they got just more impressed of our work. And they say, you need to go out and, and show what you've been doing here. Uh, um, what what is going to happen? Uh, the the United Nations declared 2023 the year of the cities because the population is becoming more and more urbanized, and they have identified the need of have a sustainable and equitable uh, development. So that is going to be the topic of the General Assembly in June. And if uh, if uh, we continue in this work, uh, this is this is where Sandak is going to be presented our work that we do in terms of social equity and working with all of the 18 cities, the county, the 18 tribes, the surrounding counties and the Republic of Mexico. Well, congratulations again. And that concludes my comments, Chair. Let me just add, in fact, uh, if, if things goes well, uh, we have confirmed a presentation from the United Nations for your next meeting in March 24th. Thank you very much, Council Member Moreno. Thank you very much, uh, Hector. So, okay, moving on to the consent items. Uh, item number five, the approval of the meeting minutes. Do you need a motion? Yes. Uh, yes, please. So, we're moved. Happy to second. Thank you very much. Before we vote, do we have public comments? Madam Clerk? Thank you, Chair. No public comments. Okay, so. Now, if you could all please vote. Chair, it looks like your button didn't register. If you could hit it again. I don't believe it's working. Yeah, your touch. <laughs> Thank you. That passes unanimously with those members present. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Moving on to today's report. Uh, item number seven, the Good Neighbor Environmental Board updates. Um, thank you. Um, I, I'm Paul Ganster, Chair of COBRO. And be, before I report on the work of another committee that I belong to, a federal advisory board, I just want to take a minute to follow up on a few things that Hector had mentioned about COBRO, which has been part of SANDAG since uh, 1996. Um, first, it was a task force, and then later uh, a working group, and, and now it's evolved uh, again to, uh, to be a task force to advise this committee. The first uh, chair of, of uh, COBRO was uh, Mike Bixler, the chair of the Sandag Board and also Imperial Beach Mayor. Um, he was followed by Art Madrid from La Mesa, and then uh, Crystal Crawford, the mayor of Del Mar at the, at the time. Um, the, 27 years later, here we are, um, we still have a membership made up of people from both sides of the border representing public and private sectors, uh, 
academia and the nonprofit sector. And it's been a key way, I think, for SANDAG to uh, obtain input from south of the border and to interact with our colleagues in what at some point will be the biggest part of our region. I'm not sure demographically when that will happen, but uh, um, Tijuana still outpaces us. Um, I don't think I need to go into the importance of the border for San Diego. Um, uh, Council Member Moreno uh, provided some discussion on that earlier. But nonetheless, um, the border is incredibly important to uh, prosperity of San Diego. Thousands and thousands of our workers live in Tijuana and commute to work here in San Diego. Right now, we have perhaps 50,000 American students, many of them from uh, San Diego, uh, going to schools in Baja California. Uh, we have families that live on both sides of the border, and the amount of international trade uh, keeps uh, increasing. So taking care of that border, I think, is critical, and, and we're delighted that uh, uh, Council Member Moreno is, uh, has that in her district. So I guess if we have observations, we talk to her about how the border is functioning. Uh, one of the things that uh, COBRA has been able to do over the years is to have uh, occasional meetings in Mexico, which is a particularly uh, effective way to interact with our colleagues south of the border so that we share the uh, pain on crossing uh, the border. Um, we can, uh, COBRO continues to work and we look forward to continue to uh, provide input to this committee. So I'll go on to my uh, presentation about the Good Neighbor Environmental Board now. Next, please. Um, I chair the Good Neighbor Environmental Board, which is a federal advisory panel, presidential uh, nomination uh, created in 1992 to advise the president and the Congress uh, on a yearly basis or more often about environmental issues on the border, particularly uh, environmental infrastructure. We operate as a regular federal committee and services to manage us are provided by EPA. Our membership is quite diverse. Um, we have the key federal agencies that have go, uh, dealings with the border involved, border state representatives, border tribal representatives, uh, local border governments, and academic uh, non-governmental organizations in the private sector are represented. Currently on the board uh, from San Diego, there's myself, uh, Mario Lopez from Sempra as a member, Al Sweedler from Del Mar, uh, Will Micklin from the Leaning Rock uh, EYPI Band of Kumeyaay Indians is on the board. Paloma Aguirre from Imperial Beach will be coming on the board uh, really to replace uh, Council Member Morena, who was on the board for a while until other things uh, interfered with uh, her ability to uh, to work on on the, the board. And then John McNeese, uh, who is a senior scholar at the Center for U.S. Mexican Studies, is also a member. Next, please. Um, our annual reports, we try to publish in Spanish and in English to share to a wider, wider audience. But in recent years, we've looked at water in the border, climate change, uh, issues involved in restoration ecology, uh, security, which we looked at twice over the years, and then energy most recently. Next, please. Our current uh, uh, report, which we've submitted this, last year in, in the form of an advisory letter, is looking at water and wastewater infrastructure along the border. And some preliminary estimates that we've made is that about 300,000 people in the border region, particularly in colonias, uh, rural areas and small towns, uh, are underserved in terms of adequate water and wastewater infrastructure. In addition, there are probably 50,000 Native Americans that lack 
proper services. And finally, we estimate about a million uh, residents of the larger urban communities uh, that are located on the international border where we have significant spillover effects from south of the border. And uh, that's an ongoing theme. Now, in many of the communities, um, poverty and ethnicity coincide with inadequate services. So I think we have some real environmental justice and equity issues there that need to be dealt with. Now, overshadowing all of this is climate change, which is not going to improve issues in terms of water and wastewater on the border, but will cause uh, definite uh, problems. Next, please. Well, our 2022, uh, the challenges for small communities and tribal groups are, are uh, somewhat uh, different and unique. Um, local small communities, uh, those in rural areas and peri-urban areas, uh, lack local administrative, technical, and financial capacity to build and maintain the proper infrastructure and to compete for grants. They just don't have enough resources in the local communities to do that. Um, and the federal funds that are available are often available in kind of a cookie cutter approach, one size fits all. And so uh, smaller isolated uh, groups who are quite numerous in the border simply can't uh, compete. The second major area of um, of issues that we um, identified or challenges are the urban areas on the international border for reasons I think that we're all familiar with here, are the impacts of transporter flows of wastewater, stormwater, sediment, and trash go from one side of the border to the other. Yet, um, uh, in theory, that's a federal responsibility but getting the federal government to assume responsibility and resolve the problems is another uh, matter. Transborder work on infrastructure is particularly complicated and, uh, and requires uh, participation of all three levels of government generally and uh, from Mexico and the United States. They're international issues and San Diego, the city of San Diego, doesn't really have the authority to simply get together with Tijuana and solve some of these issues, but instead needs to invo involve um, all the other agencies. Um, the federal authorities who in theory are responsible simply don't have regular funding available to respond to issues in a timely manner. So we're always playing catch up with ad hoc uh, solutions. Uh, I noted the first time we had major um, sewage issues in the San Diego Tijuana region, it took about a decade and a half to, to uh, resolve it. And this current time, it's about a decade or a decade and a half. And in the meantime, uh, millions of border residents uh, suffer. Next, please. On the positive side, we note that right now we have um, once in a generation water and wastewater funding through several federal uh, programs, the Binational Infrastructure Law of 2021 and the Inflation Reduction Act. So there's money out there and some has already been allocated to San Diego and the region to deal with some of the existing problems. Um, at the same time, it, the, administ the administration has moved strongly to support uh, addressing problems of smaller and underserved uh, communities through executive action. So this is really uh, a fortunate time in money and a focus coming together to try to get some of these issues dealt with. However, uh, most of the federal funding available is earmarked for loans, which small communities simply can't afford to pay back. So, uh, what we need to do, next please, is to find better ways to meet the needs of underserved uh, communities with new and tailored approaches. And we think a lot of this can be done by uh, rule changes of federal agencies and state agencies because a lot of the monies go to the states through revolving funds and then come down to the local communities. 
So um, that would help. Um, we need to develop institutionalized approaches that are efficient for dealing with cross-border spills. And we simply haven't done it. The reality of the border has, has outgrown the institutional structure to deal with the issues that we have on, on the border. Um, we also note in our report that there are some critical components of uh, border water infrastructure that are ignored in these new sources. For example, there's no money specifically for levee and dam repair in the Rio Grande, the Santa Cruz or Tijuana rivers. Um, there's no funding for irrigation districts. Um, what we don't realize is that many border irrigation districts also provide municipal water for small and rural communities. And finally, um, ongoing sediment removal is not uh, uh, funded in these new programs. So these are areas that need to be addressed. Next, please. And we think administrative action uh, can fix a lot of these problems. Uh, new rules, we need to get beyond the idea that one size fits all communities along the border. Um, we need to uh, work harder with Mexico to develop a new way to deal with transporter uh, water and wastewater issues, one that uh, is more proactive and more responsive to the actual needs. Um, and finally, uh, we suggest that Treasury, State, EPA, and Mexican counterpart agencies um, should work to adjust the uh, operating rules and funding sources for the North American Development Bank to enable NADBank to more effectively and quickly deal with um, some of these wastewater and water infrastructure issues. Right now, the bank does great work, but they're constrained by their charter, and they have to put money out uh, at uh, commercial rates, which they buy down with grant money, but we still need grants for smaller communities. So these are the... Uh, Next, please. These are the uh, main main comments we have. We'll continue to be working uh, on this topic and deliver a full report at the end of the year. And we'd certainly welcome any put any input from San Diego uh, to to help craft our report to to make sure our local message is is heard by the agencies and uh, decision makers in Washington. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Ganster. Um, let's hear first if we have any comments from the public, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Chair. We have no comments from the public. Okay, now let's hear from Borders Committee members. Does anyone have any comments? Chair, comment? Oh, please go ahead. Uh, thank you for that information. It's, it's uh, very enlightening. Uh, one of the items you mentioned is some of the, uh, obviously, infrastructure issues related to uh, multiple rivers that you mentioned, Tijuana River, you also mentioned the Rio Grande. Unfortunately, one of the rivers that is very close to us that it does run south to north is also the, south, the, um, the New River, which is located in Mexicali and runs across the border through Calexico and empties into the Salton Sea. That's been an issue for the past four to five decades. And the issues are getting worse because of the unfortunate lack of infrastructure investment uh, within the municipality of Mexicali. So when when you when I look at this report, I think we we would be inclusive of also adding the new river within your studies because again they encompass the entire southern border footprint, and this is just right next door in Imperial County. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, good point. Thanks for reminding me on that. We 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 have included the new river in a draft of a longer report we're working on, and it's just not mentioned in any of the treaties. So I think it gets left aside, but very clearly, um, the new river uh, issues are uh, incredibly important and uh, extraordinarily complex because it's not simply a matter of, of dealing with pollution, it's it's matter of, of, of the quantity uh, of the water coming through as well and the effect on the salt and sea and how that uh, uh, links with uh, agricultural pollution on, from both sides of the border. So. So it's a tough issue, and uh, and I know the state of California has been making a big effort to move that process along. But um, <laughs> I can remember the New River first surfacing 30 years ago, 
and even before that. So uh, clearly that's an area that needs to be addressed. Multiple bullet points that you mentioned, uh, all, all very uh, fair. And um, I was about going to age myself on this one, but I was about eight to nine years old when there was a 60 minutes um, uh, program that was basically uh, one of the segments was based on the new river and how it was the most polluted river in the United States. This is going back to the early 80s, so I am aging myself on that one. That, that's when you had uh, the county health officer, I think, appeared in that segment, and he talked about all the pathogens that found is correct. in the new river. That is correct. And that probably hasn't changed very much. Fortunately, no. Okay, thank you very much. Any additional comments, please? Yes, thank you, Chair. A great report, uh, Dr. Gansler. I, I wanted to mention, um, address one of the issues you mentioned about funding opportunities and the, all the challenges, you know, with federal funding and all that kind of stuff. Because right now there is a, a grant opportunity that is pretty flexible that may be of interest to all the jurisdictions that are represented here. And, and really this grant opportunity uh, applies to anywhere in the state, uh, and it's the Clean California Local Grant Program, but it, it may be uh, uh, perfect for border areas because of all the issues that you that you uh, mentioned. And uh, these grant opportunities for $100 million statewide competition, uh, grants up to $5 million, and, and matching funds uh, can be waived for disadvantaged communities, which we know most of the border areas are. Uh, so this is a great opportunity, and the state is taking, taking applications up, up until uh, April 28th uh, for, for grant opportunities. Uh, cities can apply, counties can apply, tribal nations can apply, uh, transit agencies can apply, uh, even nonprofit organizations can apply as sub-applicants. Uh, so this is a great opportunity to clean some of those areas, uh, water quality issues, trash, uh, beautification projects, making public areas better, better for the environment, better for the health of the communities near the border. I, I just want to mention that a grant opportunity because it is flexible, it is available. We can bring some, some of that money to our border region here in San Diego and Imperial County. And I hope that you all consider uh, applying for those funds. Uh, I think I mentioned it's up to $5 million, uh, 100 million is the total available statewide. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that, that, that's the type of opportunity necessary. But the complement to that is uh, EPA and some other agencies are trying to develop cooperative one-stop shops for small and uh, underserved communities uh, where they don't have specialists to go out and look for funding at every different agency, but really a, a way to link up needy communities and funds such as this and help in preparation of, of grants. And, and that's a great move in the right direction, but we need those in every state and, uh, and we need more of them. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, I appreciate everyone's comments. Moving forward, moving on to the next item, item number eight, uh, the overview of vertical housing development in the city of Tijuana. Um, and our presentation will be uh, presented uh, virtually. Hector, if you are uh, already promoted. Hello. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Hello, everybody. We can hear you. Thank you. Okay, great. Well, first of all, thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm going to, to uh, share with you something that is going on down here in Tijuana. Uh, first of all, let me introduce myself. I'm Hector Bustamante, CEO of Bustamante Realty Group. We are the largest real estate firm in Baja, and I would say in northern part of Mexico, with over 100 uh, realtors. And we've been at it for about 20 years. We've sold over 100 developments of vertical towers, mixed use projects, office buildings, and several other uh, master plan communities. So um, basically, right now, Tijuana is 
you've heard the term uh, booming probably, but uh, what I use is not that word. I use more blooming because it's been uh, a different type of success that we had in the, the, in the latest years. Uh, Hector, could you please, I, I don't know if I, if I can uh, take it to the next slide. I will just say next and say, okay. Well, first, just this is uh, for people who are not very familiarized with our city. I would say that these are important facts that we are almost 3 million people now with uh, in a metro zone because now we are um, almost together with Tecate and Rosarito, largest city in Mexico, fastest growing. But a very important fact is that we are a very young city. It was, we've on, we only have 133 years old since our foundation in comparison to 500 years of Mexico City, for example. So you could say that right now Tijuana is exactly in the stage of growing pains. Everything that happens here is new and we always have growing pains because we're growing so fast. Next, please. This is um, the economic development partner up or hired a study from the ULI, the Urban Land Institute, uh, some years back, about five or six years ago, where they were um, thinking of what was going to happen with downtown Tijuana. And this is their projection for 40 years. You might think that this is a crazy rendering of a lot of buildings in downtown, but the next slide, please, shows you what the difference in downtown San Diego was between in 30 years. That was 1985. And the other one is 2015, which only in 30 years, everybody remembers how downtown Tijuana used to be, uh, downtown San Diego, I'm sorry, and what it is right now. So I think that downtown Tijuana right now, it's in its 10th year of transformation. So we have 20 more years to go since till we are what we want to be to achieve. Next, please. So this is a 10 year period. And, and if you could please go a, a little fast on each of the slides, because I wanna get to 2023. This is a map of Tijuana where most of the developments are concentrated in what we call the gold zone of Tijuana, very close to the border and also to the country club. Next, please, to the golf course. All these projects were done in one, in a 10 year period. They were built, sold and delivered, and now they are, people living there. And next please, next slide. And next slide, I'm, I'm not going to give you details of every building, but basically what the message that we want to convey is that uh, there's a lot of construction that went on within 10 years. A little more please, next slide. Of shopping centers, vertical towers, uh, mixed use projects, next, next please. Uh, um, Okay, and here, if you could please uh, push the, go, go one back and, and there's a video there, the YouTube, just if you could touch it, okay. Thank you. So this is an, uh, no, it's not showing, no? Okay. This is just to give you an example of the type of projects that are being built now in Tijuana. This is uh, about 80% done in construction and it's 100% sold. So all of the projects that I showed you within a 10 year period of building are all built and sold. Uh, next slide, please. I I'm trying to go a little fast because I know that you have a big agenda uh, to get through. So you can go to the next slide, please. Okay. So. Right now, all these projects that we're gonna see are under construction. And I would say that 90% of these projects are already 100% sold. So they are building what, what, what was sold in the pre-sales process in Tijuana. So this is where the US consulate used to be. They tore it down, they built this uh, building. Now the, the US consulate is in another place, but this was the old site of the US consulate. Next, please. This is in downtown Tijuana, Revolution Avenue, next. This one is in a new area that we call the third uh, stage of Rio Zone, where it would probably be like the new area of Tijuana that is very well um, planned and urbanized. And this project, as you can see, it looks a lot like projects that are built in San Diego. And basically when we designed this project, we did take a lot of analogs from 
from projects in San Diego where you have commercial area on the bottom and 216 condominium units on top, all sold, by the way. Next. This is in Playas de Tijuana. Next, please. All in process of construction. This one is right when you get across the border in front of Costco in Tijuana. Next one, please. This one is, is uh, the next one, please. This is a 236 unit. This one is called Link. It's in near where the racetrack is. This is a 120 units. Next one, please. 360 units also in the, in the east side of Tijuana. Next one, please. This is in Playas de Tijuana. Next. Uh, this one is also in Playas de Tijuana. Next one, please. Next one. I'm going to get to the big ones now. Okay, next one, please. All of these are being built right now. Most of them started already delivering. Next, please. This is right on the golf course, um, 90 condominiums. I would say that the interesting thing about this project in particular is that some units range in one to $2 million and they are uh, 90, 90 something units, 100% sold. And out of the buyers, 95% of the buyers are from Tijuana, Tijuana residents that bought properties from one to $2 million, okay? Next. This is um, hospital um, consultorios medicos. I'm not the translation, but these are uh, medical clinics. Next. Um, another one, please. Next. Next, please. Next. Next, <laughs> this is 360 units, but next I wanna get to the big ones. Next, please. Next, please. Next. This one is a project in Revolution Avenue that has three different um, usage. A Holiday Inn Express, an Indigo Hotel, and it's going to be 60 condo, uh, hotel, condo hotel units being built right now in, in Revolution Avenue. Next one, please. That's going to be basically the, one of the tallest buildings here in Tijuana, which with 35 floors. This is a hospital that came from Guadalajara. The name of the hospital is Puerta de Hierro. And on top is gonna to have a Marriott hotel and also condominiums. Next one, please. This one is uh, two towers that are being built inside a shopping center that just opened here in Tijuana that's called Peninsula. Next one, please. This is Peninsula Plaza. Um, most of you know probably Liverpool, which is our big department store in all of Mexico. This is the first Liverpool that we have in Tijuana. And since the day it opened, it's been breaking record. It opened only a few months ago and it's breaking records in sales uh, within all of Liverpool's in Mexico. So the, the project is going great. Next, please. This is the landmark Tijuana. It also has three uh, buildings of condominiums, an office building, a hotel, and a shopping center in the bottom. This right now would be the most expensive uh, project in Tijuana to, to buy. To give you an idea, for a condominium that has about a thousand square feet, the cost per square feet would be about $4,400 per square feet. Then this would be uh, right now the most expensive. Next, please. Um, this project is already under construction also, 600 units. The two towers in the back are condominiums and the tower in the front is offices. Next, please. That's next one, please. Next one, please. It's a beautiful project, it's called OVA. So this is some basics of, of real estate. Our median price of, an, of a unit is $367,000, that's our medium. Our medium price per square feet is $300. Uh, we probably sell about 100 units every year, every, every month, I'm sorry. And the land cost is $100 per square feet in the um, gold zone. Next one, please. And we do have challenges, which the number one would be our NIMBYs. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with them, but here in Tijuana, right now, they basically all day, la, la población, our neighbors are complaining that there's too much construction going on. And since they don't know, that this is the way to go to get a better a mobility in the city. Basically, we have always trying to negotiate with them and trying to get our government officials um, not to um, 
pay a lot of attention to them because then our development stops basically. Our next issue, challenge, urban infrastructure. Basically we need, there's so much construction that is going on that we need water services, streets and all this uh, infrastructure. Otherwise we are not going to be able to, um, to, to keep growing. And the last one is our public, next please, public transportation. This is, I would say that this is one of our biggest challenges and our biggest issues down here in Tijuana. We don't have good public transportation or you would say that we don't have public transportation at all. So this complicates a lot because we have a lot of, a, lot, a big part of our population lives very far from where they work. So they have to use a car because they don't have public transport. So Tijuana has a problem with traffic, very, very big problem. I would say that um, it's, conversation that we have every day. So would they compare it to Los Angeles even with the problems that we have? Um, and next, and I think in that, with that, basically I'm finished. So in, in, um, in conclusion, Tijuana right now is blooming. Um, our buyers are 90% local buyers from Tijuana and from Mexico, but we do, we are very excited because we're starting to see a trend where Americans are now renting and buying down here in Tijuana. Even though everybody talks about that everybody's moving because of the price, that's not really accurate right now. It's a trend that it's only starting, but we definitely see that it's going to be a big trend to follow. And um, the reason that Americans are moving down to Tijuana, this is very important. It's not because of the price. Everybody says because San Diego is so expensive and Tijuana it's one third of the cost in real estate, which yes, of course that has a, an influence, but more important than that, Tijuana has become a real interesting place. It's, um, it's a city that right now is be, be, be leaving a cultural change with um, our food and our travel and our wine country and everything. So we have travel bloggers basically traveling, recording, and then we have millions of positive views in YouTube for the city of Tijuana, which is attracting a lot of tourism, and we are leaving this new uh, phase. So with that, uh, I thank you very much for letting me give you this presentation. I know that it's very fast, and I, I uh, um, English, English is my second language, I apologize, but here is my information. I would be more than happy to share any other information and I'm available with any questions that you might have in the future. Thank you very much, and Hector, thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you very much, Hector. Very thorough, very uh, impressive uh, presentation. Uh, do we have any uh, comments from the public, Madam Clerk? Thank you, Chair. We do have a couple of public comments. Uh, Tim Bailish, if you'd like to step up first and then online, we will go to Blair Beekman next. Good afternoon, committee. I'm honored to be here with all of you and for those online. My name is Dr. Timothy Bylash. I've spoken in Sandeg meetings over the past year and a half or so. I'm up in the Del Mar area, city of San Diego, just near the I-5. I consider it mid-county coastal. Uh, and I am a physician and scientist by training and practice. OBGYN for 32 years, just as a matter of introductions. And I apologize, I have this as item seven on my agenda. And so I, this is not as prepared as I would hope to be. But the question I have, um, a few years ago, I was in Fargo, North Dakota, which is right across the border from Minnesota. And Minnesota had no sales tax. Fargo had a very high income tax. So people would live in Fargo and then go and shop in Minnesota. And of course, there's no border between the states, but there was a lot of resentment. So I applaud this committee. I applaud all the international and uh, cultural aspects of uh, development. I have some concerns because I've been around longer than some of you in different parts of the country. And I see a repeating pattern about development, gentrification, and uh, the mention was housing prices are a third down in Tijuana. That would make a difference to me if I were going to move there. And of course, transportation across the border, I think, is crucial. So I'm supportive of that. But the three things that I consider are seismic climate and environmental impacts on transportation and housing, particularly, but also businesses. And um, 
right now there might not be a lot of American investment, but I'm sure it's going to grow. And I have concerns about the role of profit, profiteering, and uh, moving out of places like San Francisco because of tele uh, telecommuting, selling your expensive house and buying it here on the coast, pushing people from the coast out to East County, and then East County complaining, we don't have enough infrastructure. So I don't pay taxes in Mexico. Mexicans don't pay taxes here, but yet dollars will flow. Although my understanding is when I go to a foreign country, they limit how much money I can bring in or spend there. And so this issue of the barriers we set up for people, which is a lot of the, the talk about immigration and cross-border issues and transportation and dollars and funding. And I think these are all issues I would bring to this committee um, I don't have any uh, enough understanding, but I am really glad to have access to your expertise. So thank you. Thank you very much. I think our next speaker is Blair Beekman, and Blair will be our final speaker on this item. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Uh, thanks a lot for this item. It was really interesting to me. I moved down to San Diego from the San Francisco Bay Area and San Jose. Uh, in July of last year, 2022. And that was right at the time that there was uh, just some sort of a uh, gangster activity uh, within Tijuana. They're doing some really crazy flamboyant stuff to prove their metal uh, in community life. And it was really hurtful to me because it's made me a bit fearful of wanting to go to Tijuana, which is why I've moved down to San Diego in the first place. I want to visit uh, town and be a part of that uh, feeling and atmosphere and purpose. And for, for drug people to be doing this sort of things, uh, I don't know what point they're really proving. And I find it a bit hurtful and insulting to an overall future that we're all trying to build together that they should learn to be a part of and not simply attack and destroy and dominate. And uh, it's the work you're doing on these issues that I very much thank you, that it can talk to them. It can talk to all of us about the future of public transportation. And uh, what I think uh, with housing issues in, in this country, we're trying to understand the concepts of uh, uh, ideas like mixed income housing where people of very low income can live in the same buildings as people of high income. And that shouldn't be fearful to ourselves. It's an important concept for the future of this country. I hope it can be for Tijuana because I think it would uh, help maintain a, a certain charm and, and purpose, sense of purpose of, of working together as a community process and not separating us into different classes and regions that I hope can be taken uh, to heart in Tijuana. And it's, so, so, it's that sort of thinking that ha is how you really talk, talk to uh, these drug people and ask them to stop <laughs> and ask them to not intimidate and work on a, what is a, a, a hopeful future for all of us. Uh, there's a lot of good practices out there doing those sort of things. We need to share those sort of things and make it clear what's really possible in our future. And uh, thanks a lot for uh, this item today. The future of a border town, I think, really interesting in this country. And you're sharing why. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. That concludes the public comments. Thank you very much. Do we have any comments from border committees members? Chair. No. Chair. Hector, do we have uh, translation services? Yes. Okay. Uh, Hector, el otro Hector. <laughs> Buenas tardes. Eh, la presentación estuvo súper chingona. Te felicito. Eh, mencionaste un tema muy importante y ese es el tema de la logística. Cruzo Tijuana con frecuencia y los tráficos en horas pico son más que tremendos y es muy difícil eso. Y obviamente cuando estás desarrollando los megaproyectos que, estás, que, que acabas de platicar, obviamente eso es un impedimento que la gente pues, no les gusta. ¿no? Entonces, Quería ver si pudieras platicar en unos dos, tres minutos qué ha avanzado el Ayuntamiento de Tijuana en ese aspecto. Sorry. We lost Hector. I think he, uh, I don't know if he was having technical difficulties, but he's no longer on the line. Uh, um, okay, then I'll reserve uh, all my comments because they were literally directed at his presentation. 
I'm sorry about that. I can, Chair, I can let you know if he, we do see him log back on. Um, okay. We apologize. Um, any, any additional comments from any uh, order committees members? Um, Chair, we do have um, Council Member Dillard, who is on the committee, uh, was not able to come in person today, but she is on Zoom and would like to make a comment, if that's all right. Uh, 100%. Uh, Council Member Dillard, you can go ahead when you're ready. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you uh, so much. Um, first of all, I'd like to um, uh, say thank you uh, to Mr. Uh, Bustamante uh, regarding his presentation. Uh, I'm rather new at this, uh, so I just um, had a, a question about the um, the safety and what laws are required uh, in building his um, his structures, his beautiful structures. And I was wondering if there was any requirements for earthquake uh, fitting or or being fitted for. Um, earthquake if they have any laws uh just not familiar with um their building requirements and just wanted to you know uh verify uh that information thank you i, I believe the presenter is not uh, longer connected but uh, i can convey the questions to the presenter and make a uh, uh, Try to get uh, an answer from him if he's fine. Is that a, that's okay? So moving forward, um, is it okay to move on to the next item? Yes. Okay. Moving on to the next item, uh, item number eight. Um, State Route 11, Otay Mesa East Port of Entry Project Update. Okay, these are familiar faces in this committee, and I want to welcome Maria Orozco, Nikki Titank. Mario Orozco. Oh, Mario Orozco, I'm sorry. It's Nikki Tianco and Maria Rodriguez Molina. We will see them quite often as they are bringing us important information about one of the largest projects in the region, the future Otay Mesa East Port of Entry. I understand this project will be moving at a faster pace this year, but on this occasion, our presenters will be presenting a general overview of this key piece of border infrastructure, which will impact not only the adjacent border, but the state of California and the nation. I should say both nations, Mario, Nikki, and Maria, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, again, my name is Mario Orso. Uh, for the purpose of this presentation, I'm the lead on the Otay Mesa East project by also have another side gig as the chief deputy uh, for Caltrans in District 11. Um, with me, like you said, is Maria, the co-project director at Sandak, and Nikki, the co-project director at Caltrans. Um, a little bit of history, and but I, I'm going to go, I'm very famous for going off script. And as what was being mentioned about being that you're so many new members here in some all friends also, um, you know, this committee has been uh, pivotal in many, many things. This committee uh, was um, helped us on getting uh, the first border master plan in the nation uh, that Caltrans developed with the state of Baja and it became the norm in the United States to develop border master plans between two countries. This committee was the one that pushed for the second tribal summit that negotiated the position with the tribes and and to bring them into the SANDAC board and to the borders committee. So uh, you all should be feel very honored because this committee has really made history in the region and in the nation in uh, being very forward thinkers on inclusion and planning uh, with all the different borders. And you know, I applaud the United Nations recognition, but it's nothing that did not come in a vacuum. This committee has been working for 20 years on all this. So I really applaud you all for that. Now, the State Route 11 Otay Mesa East project, 
just a little bit of history as we're going into memory lane in many things here. Uh, this project came about um, when in 2006, again, this committee together in partnership with Caltrans and Sandak, we developed the border impact study mm -hmm. that was the first study that really quantified the economic impacts the border wait times had on our region and on our state. Uh, there's where we saw that we were losing substantial amounts of funding. Mm -hmm. Oh, and Maria's gonna put in a video. Can we, can we take the volume out? Yeah. So Mario can speak while we watch the video. So the the um that's how we began the project. And we're right now showing you an aerial view video that Highway Patrol took of just recently what the Otay Mesa border crossing is in, from a freight perspective and the long waits that we're dealing. You can see the trucks that are uh, right now online on the Mexican side to later cross into customs, U.S. customs. So as I'm speaking, you know, and giving you a little bit of the, of the history of this project, we began in 2006 and even before when it was envisioned in the 90s, knowing that the expansion of San Isidro and Otay Mesa was not gonna be enough of what we had planned of growth in our regions and to be competitive. And I think the past presentations and Mr. Ganster's comments also kind of fit into all this. Uh, so that's how we started this project, 2008. We began formally with the environmental document. We achieved a presidential permit to build a new border crossing. And we began also with a joint vision of creating an appropriate access. As you can see here, the existing ports of entry don't have appropriate access to, to some, some of our transportation facilities to our ports of entry. And this Otay Mesa East Day Route 11 looks into that in providing appropriate access as a system operating all the border crossings and having uh, a well-defined access to the port that can be dynamic and manageable. With that, I'm gonna pass it on to Nikki to start explaining where we are, what we have achieved with the project, as well as the benefits, and then Maria will go on our next steps and we'll all be open for any questions. Thank you. All right, so as what uh, Councilwoman Moreno mentioned earlier, uh, Otay Mesa, the existing Otay Mesa okay. port of entry is San Diego region's uh, main commercial border crossing. And uh, the San Isidro port of entry, which is the busiest uh, land border crossing in the Western hemisphere. Both of those are congested and the border delays and wait times cost United States and Mexico a combined uh, 3.4 billion of annual economic output and also 80,000 jobs each year. Uh, with the border de delays and wait times, it, it also contributes to greenhouse gas emissions. And we all know that California is uh, um, contribu con contributing and committing to um, reduce the impacts uh, to climate change. So with the completion of the Otay Mesa East, it will provide economic benefits, uh, reduce carbon emissions, and also improve the quality of life here in the San Diego region. So what you're looking at here is a diagram. Uh, it's a synopsis of what the Otay Mesa East border region um, currently uh, we have built. Uh, this is everything that we have built so far. Uh, state, state Route 125, 905, and all of its connectors. And of course, the newest uh, State Route 11 and its ancillary elements like this Siempre Viva interchange are substantially complete. Uh, this is a project that um, speaks to a true partnership at all levels of the government. We have the federal, the states, and the local stakeholders that work together to come up and build uh, our nation's uh, economic future. Uh, currently, uh, on the Mexico side, uh, Mexico has completed the design of the port of entry and the roadway that leads to, to the facility. 
Also, they have completed the utility relocations and they are ready to uh, construct the roadway facilities while they are trying to complete the acquisition of the right of way. Uh, this uh, pro corridor project, uh, we have all in all together in the U.S. side, we have committed to date $742 million. And we are working on some strategies to uh, finance the rest uh, of the project. So what's currently going on uh, out there at the facility? We have the site preparation project, which uh, is uh, to create, uh, to bring in a, a 2 million cubic yards of dirt in total. And that is to create a flat pad connecting the State Route 11 elevation and connecting to Mexico's elevation. In this project, we're also installing drainage systems that will address any existing interim and future uh, runoffs. Uh, another critical investment that we're working on are the relocations of the utilities, uh, one of which have already been complete, and the other one uh, will, be com will start relocation in April. Uh, also, lastly, we're bringing in new utilities to the site. We're working on awarding a contract uh, to bring in the new utilities, which includes water, sewer, electric, uh, and communications. Uh, it is, this is an example of a world-class project. It's a big project for the United States. It's a big project for Mexico. And uh, I'm going to leave it at that. I'm going to give it to Maria to talk about the milestones. So two big milestones I want to highlight from last year is the one-of-a-kind agreement we signed with Mexico. We're visionaries here. We thought, why not make it even more efficient, this project, and collect only one point? So let's accelerate that processing and collect on SR11, and we'll share the revenues with Mexico. So we put a lot of work. Betsy led the effort on the legal side, and it was a great success. And part of the team traveled to uh, Mexico City last year to sign this. The other big event uh, that we celebrated was the award of $150 million of the infra grant. We have we were lucky to have here the secretary announcing the award, and that would allow us to move into the first phase of the project uh, to construct the commercial side of the port of entry. So what we're currently working on are the negotiations with our federal partners, CBP and GSA, on how we will deliver this port of entry to the federal government once we complete it. And we're going down to the details on responsibilities for the operations and maintenance, the equipment. Once we have that agreement in place, we'll be able to fully start working on constructing this port of entry. Uh, we are selecting a methodology that allows us to accelerate by doing design and construction at the same time. So we're doing everything possible to make this project a reality as soon as possible. While we finish the negotiations with CBP and GSA, we'll have a better idea on how to finalize the financial structure. But what I can say for now, it's a combination of grants, uh, federal and state grants, a federal um, TIFIA loan, and then other types of loans. So it will be a complete package uh, that we'll put together in the coming months. We continue working with Mexico on all of the other agreements, such as uh, the tour governance, the ITS operations and maintenance, and other technical designs uh, for the port of entry and the roads. And finally, we just selected the architectural firm um, that will take the lead on designing the actual buildings for CBP and GSA. The backbone of this project is truly the information technology. And from the beginning, we thought we needed to advance the most complicated and most important part of the project. And we team up uh, as anything on this project with Caltrans. And we worked on a border wait time system. And five years ago, we implemented southbound border wait times. Those wait times are on the Caltrans website, Quick Maps. And recently, we concluded the installation of the um, elements in Tijuana to measure northbound border wait times. We're testing the system. Uh, we have volunteers that 
do the drives and we check that what we're reporting is correct. And we're working on an app, mobile app, to display this information for both northbound and southbound traffic at both San Isidro and Otay. And we'll display passenger vehicles and commercial vehicles. That will come out this summer. So we're, we're really excited to be able to um, provide to the public information so that they can plan better their trips during the day. Um, as you know, the, the goal of this project is to provide a faster, efficient way of crossing, um, safe and secure, uh, with an average 20 to 30 minute wait time. But at the same time, we're really focused on how do we work them as a system so that we see improvements at all of the other ports of entry. And so we're putting in place the regional border management system. So we have information to better utilize the resources we have. So we'll see decrease in wait times at Ota Mesa East, but we'll also see impacts of decreases of 40 to 50% at the other two ports of entry. So that's been our focus, and we're really excited to get to construction uh, as soon as possible. And I'll pass it on to Mario to conclude. Um, a couple of comments. Um, we just threw a lot of stuff at, at, at you from this project. I think some, some of the big highlights is we're building the project is not a port of entry only. It's a transportation system, a highway, and ancillary facilities, a way station, and the port of entry itself. We have finished the highway portion of it, uh, and we uh, have bought the property for the port of entry, and we're under construction on the site of the port of entry. In order to finance a piece of this project, it's going to be through congestion pricing, which is variable tolls, and, and that's why the ITS is so um, essential to us. For uh, Supervisor Escobar, the border wait time system that we're developing here, we're also looking into implementing it in Imperial County. We are uh, also deploying separately from this project uh, equipment for the southbound uh, wait time, saying we will partner with, hopefully, with the city of uh, Mexicali for a northbound launch. But, you know, every journey starts with the first step, and this is our first step here in San Diego County. With that, we try to provide you a holistic presentation of where we are with this complex project that has been in the development from more than two decades now, and that we're starting to see the light on the other side of the tunnel. The port of entry construction is imminent, and Mexico is doing their part, and also on their facilities and their financing element. That concludes our presentation, and we're open for any questions. Thank you. Um, Mario, Nikki, and Maria, thank you very much. Very thorough presentation. Um, the Border Committee's 100% is, is prepared to support you in any, any manner that we can. Um, do we have any uh, public comments, Madam Clerk? Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Excuse me, we do have uh, four public commenters. Uh, we'll start with Tim Bylash, and then we'll go to Blair Beekman on Zoom. Thank you again, committee, um, for taking my comments. My name is Dr. Timothy Bylash. I'm up in the Del Mar region, but actually in San Diego City. I've spoken at several Sandag meetings. I um, am the middle child of a large family and learned negotiation as survival. So um, sometimes I'm not as absolute about things. I'm also an all around nudge. So I try to nudge people in better directions and I am really about good government and good citizenship and combining the two to deal with bad politics. Um, the poet Robert Frost had a uh, poem, something like, good fences make good neighbors. And I think uh, good borders make good neighbors. And perhaps really the truth underlying it is good neighbors make good borders. So I'm really excited about the fantastic work of all the people involved in making this happen. I, I'm a new person to understanding and learning about it. It is fabulous and uh, congratulations and keep going. Um, I think we have two underlying problems when you get into different countries, different languages, different cultures. One is misunderstanding and the other is segregationism. And we don't think in my opinion of these problems in terms of those two, 
But within the county of San Diego in the past year coming to these meetings, I've uh, experienced or observed a great deal of both. And the fact of the matter is, is that Ote Mesa East is invisible to people I talk to in East County, as fantastic an idea and necessity as it is. And so what comes into our uh, point of view? We have violent conflict between Russia and Ukrainian borders today. We have nonviolent, essentially, contact between Mexico and the United States, United States and Canada. So I see this as an opportunity. And what I offer is the idea, is it possible to take some of the newer technologies we have, some that Sandeg is looking into, to improve and overcome the language barriers and the fear that that creates in the public transportation system and these border crossings. Um, I'm a captive audience on public transportation. Might that be an opportunity for people to give talks or to provide some type of uh, educational opportunities, particularly bilingual ones? And the other part is whether or not some of these bilingual technologies can be developed at the border crossings, at the stations, at the hubs, and on these so that um, we can more easily understand each other and overcome those crazy, stupid impediments to living good lives. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Next uh, comment. Uh, next will be Blair Beekman, who will be followed by Karina Contreras. <laughs> Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Uh, thanks a lot for this item. Thanks a lot for the words from the previous speaker. Um, it's always difficult to develop borders in our lives. I think we all place boundaries and borders on ourselves. It's good luck how we can define those borders and boundaries in good terms. Uh, really working on that. Uh, I hope we can work on that well. Uh, I work on uh, an important part of my life is, is the future of tech accountability and openness for local communities that I'm interested in in San Diego and Tijuana being the border area, you know, how a cross pollinization process takes place with such issues, you know, uh, that that open uh, that the future of technology should be an open process that an, an everyday person in the community can ask questions and receive answers about what exactly the tech is doing that we're asking for. And I, I met, I'm guessing possibly that for as good as the, uh, as the bilingual tech may be, it may have some biometric uh, uh, components to it. Uh, that sort of thing is like fearful for government to talk about with community openly. And the work I'm doing is how to make that process open and understandable and, and what can be the open public policy practices of it. What exactly is the data that would be collected with those sort of things and what are the parameters of how it works. We couldn't do these things 10 years ago that I think we can simply learn to ask now and that we should be able to ask. Uh, good luck in how that can uh, work on a border. And I'm interested, uh, that's kind of why I'm here, is part of why I'm here is to see how that can develop what interesting practices just our human decency can, can work towards. Uh, with that all said, uh, if I, I don't know how much more time I have here. I will try to quickly offer, uh, to speak of human decency, uh, I'm a bit nervous to mention uh, the, the drug cartel gangster element uh, that I don't want to hurt their feelings. I certainly don't want to, uh, you know, cause any sort of rift. I mean, I really want to work towards, uh, you know, some good practices that if they understand what is possible, uh, it, I think it would uh, calm down their, their need to be flamboyant about use of terror and use of uh, weapons and use of uh, violence and, and to address you know, community issues. And I, I think we're, we are on a process that can really do some amazing good work that uh, you know, we have to learn to better understand ourselves and then we pass that along to them that makes things a better world overall. And I think they can hopefully understand that and learn the ideas of peace that's behind this thing, good thing. Peace and good reasoning. Uh, thanks a lot. And hopefully, uh, yeah, this is how I'll hopefully be able to talk about these things safely. Thank you. Thank you, Blair. Next public comment. Uh, next will be Kearney Contreras, followed by Eduardo Cabrera. And Eduardo will be our last commenter. Yes, hello, my name is Karina Contreras. I'm the transportation policy advocate for Climate Action Campaign. 
And, uh, you know, someone who grew up in North County uh, going across the border a lot uh, to Tijuana, Rosarito, Ensenada, Tecate, Mexicali. Uh, it's, it's fascinating to me uh, what we have in front of us here. Uh, we really, as a, a binational region, uh, this is critical uh, to being able to uh, better move goods and, and people. Uh, and with that, you know, our economy and different economic opportunities, which I hope that communities that are most impacted by air pollution will have the ability uh, to be part of these different economic opportunities that are going to be increasing uh, uh, with the border crossing here at Otay, Otay Mesa East. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious uh, if there will be a robust air monitoring with annual public review of data and proposed mitigation strategies and uh, you know, a way to fund uh, implementation of air pollution mitigation strategies. And you know, will toll fees help uh, towards funding the implementation of these air pollution uh, mitigation strategies? I think that's gonna be critical to uh, the folks that live here now and the ones that may live in this region in the future. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Kearney. Uh, Eduardo, you're up. Thank, th 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 thank you so much to everyone. Good afternoon, I'm Eduardo Carrera, CEO of Smart Border Systems. And first, uh, we want uh, to congratulate Mario, Nikki, Maria, and all the Sand Sandag organization for the terrific progress of, that of Time is East. Uh, State Route 11. Uh, we want to congratulate all the team and all the efforts of coordination at a national level. From a smart border systems, we think uh, that dynamic pricing would combine with uh, a different innovative proposals leveraging technology could improve the, the performance of border wait times, not only for the future of Time Mesa East port of entry, but in a more scalable and inclusive way, providing reliability for both travelers and customs authorities. Thank you. This is all my comments and congratulations again to all the team of Sandag. Thank you, Eduardo. That was the last uh, public comment. Yes, sir. Thank you. Bring it back chair, to... just can I just say a comment? We are putting in air monitors already, and we are developing strategic. Uh, technology measures to correlate border wait times with air emissions and develop strategies to lower those air emissions and zero emission vehicle strategies also for infrastructure around the border with this project. Thank you, Mario. Bringing it back to this committee, any comments by committee members? Go ahead. Thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation. And I also want to thank the team because they've met with me personally. I know it was via Zoom. Um, I started on this committee in 2020 and never met anybody in person until recently uh, due to the circumstances. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, and I, I, I would say that there was nothing like actually going down to the site. I've been down there twice now and seeing it firsthand, you know, the visuals are one thing and the, and the wait time, but standing on that mound of dirt and looking over across the border and seeing the vehicles waiting and, you know, hearing they're idling for six, up to six hours, five, six hours to get across. It really tells the, you know, the story of what, how valuable this project is and East County, of course, supports it. Um, well, I wouldn't say of course, but I certainly do. Uh, but that did lead me to what I wanted to talk about because I am representing East County and I, I have lived uh, in various cities for the last 57 years, El Cajon, Lakeside, um, La Mesa, a smidge in the city of San Diego when I attended San Diego State. And then um, now I live in Santee. And I asked when I first got on this committee, well, why are, you know, why are why is East County here? We're not near the border. And it was explained to me, you know, there are borders within the region and uh, we we have our own unique challenges. So that's what I wanted to share too, kind of segueing off of this is what I see, even though I live in Santee and I hate the 52 freeway and that commute, 
Um, I've traveled all the freeways in East County, and the one that I really wanted to bring to everybody's attention is the 67. Um, it's, it's, there's no way, other way to put it, except it's a death trap if you're coming from Ramona to Lakeside. I, I've grew up in Lakeside for a big chunk of my life. Um, I have a lot of friends that live on the Barona Indian Reservation. My daughter actually works at Barona Casino, and she lives in Ramona now. And and I, um, the commute from Ramona down to Lakeside comes down to one lane. And and I think that if if everybody had the opportunity to visit the 67 and and see what I see every every day and what we see out there, it would be, be one of those eye opening moments like I had when I went to the Otai border crossing and saw what I saw. So just want to throw that out there that that might be something we could all do as a region is is see it through um, our our view out, out in East County. And um, maybe there's some more that we can do together on that project. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Additional comments by committee members? I'll circle back and again, thank you for the umpteenth time, Nikki Maria and Mario, <laughs> Mario Orso. Uh, I've been, I've been uh, a member and a previous vice chair of this committee through the years and, and I always uh, value your presentations as as a as a advisor member coming from the outside of Imperial County and coming into San Diego County for this project. It uh, is just, it mesmerizes me how this has developed, evolved and all the mechanisms that need to be tackled in order for this to take place and continue taking place. And I hope this serves as a vehicle for future development, not just at, at, at the local uh, ports of entry, but worldwide, because this is this is something, as you mentioned, Hector, something that should be taken to the United Nations or something to that effect, because that's how dynamic this will be for this region and how it can be implemented elsewhere, or it could be implemented elsewhere. With that, moving on to item number nine, the next meeting is scheduled for March 24, 2023. Same bad place, same bad channel. Uh, and prior to that, there will be an uh, offsite meeting scheduled for March 9th and 10th at Viejas Casino. So I hope to see you all there. Prior to concluding, do you have any other additional comments by the committee or anybody else? I'd like to share if you don't mind. Oh, you get okay. Never mind. We did have one more public comment, but I think we're okay to adjourn. So we're good to adjourn, or somebody has a public comment? No, nope, we're okay. Uh, very, very short. Yeah, very short. And you can cut him off uh, after 10 seconds. We have simul simultaneous translation or no? Yes. Do we? Yeah, uh, okay. there, there's the translator online. Bueno, eh, primeramente quiero agradecer a Sandak, uh, Héctor Vanegas y todo el equipo, este, la, la supervisora y chair del board, este, Nora Vargas, al igual que otras dos personas que están aquí presentes, eh, Kenia Samarripa del San Diego Regional Chamber of Commerce, y Ernesto Chávez de Binational Affairs de la ciudad de Tijuana, eh, porque entre todos organizamos eh, lo que comentaba en un inicio Héctor Vanegas acerca del de foro binacional eh, con ONU Habitat y que se interesó este, la regidora Vivian Moreno. Fueron dos días de trabajo, el primero fue aquí en Sandac, nos apoyaron con toda la logística, el expertise, la gente, este, pues a, aquí se desarrolló. Y en Tijuana hubo un segundo día enfocado a economía binacional con organizaciones de ambos lados de la frontera, cámaras de comercio, eh, autoridades y demás. Fue muy interesante porque lo que se pretende es crear un mecanismo eh, que en este caso se le llama el Metro Lab, el cual eh, sea algo institucional para la cooperación transfronteriza y que podamos abordar nuestros temas eh, este, pues, encabezado por Sandak. Estamos viendo como siguientes pasos. Vamos a agradecer a todos los que participaron y vamos a, a proponer cómo podemos ya este, institucionalizar este mecanismo que fue supervisado por ONU Habitat a nivel internacional y participó también el, el área metropolitana de Barcelona. Entonces, agradecer a, a todos los que hicieron esto posible y para que quede sentado en las minutas de esta reunión. Muchas David, gracias. Antes, yo de, creo de, que... antes de que te despidas, por favor, lo, lo, tu posición. Ah, David Pérez Tejada Padilla, el director de Asuntos Binacionales del Gobierno del Estado de Baja California. Y yo creo que sería una buena oportunidad para que pudiéramos ver la manera de replicarlo el Condado Imperial y Mexicali. Este, siempre alzas la voz, al igual que yo lo hacía cuando 
cuando venía representando a la ciudad de Mexicali para poder este, tener mecanismos también de aquel lado de la frontera. Con mucho gusto, te lo agradezco y gracias por la información. Uh, with that uh, meeting adjourned, stay safe. The weather's crazy out there. <laughs>